welcome to everyone to the event today. It's our pleasure to host. We've got a great lineup today. Um, something we hope to be highly informative and timely given the European specific developments. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Grant Davies and I'm Equiland's Head of European Sales. And I'm delighted to say a few words on behalf of Equiland. We're always honoured to be approached by ECMA to help host this event. As some of you may be aware, or hopefully most of you are aware, Equiland is a provider of a global electronic trading platform across bonds. Equiland is not the only thing we do. Equities are not the only thing we do. We do bonds also. So securities lending, collateral, repo-based activity, and swaps across a number of our trading platforms. Our presence in the repo market grows. I think as the securities, finance, and repo businesses collide, as banks and uh, infrastructure start to look at centralization of what is effectively similar transactions and look to expand and electronify liquidity more and more. Our application and the application of our products grows more extensively and we've seen that more in the past few years and certainly at the forefront right now. I think one of the things that's been tested certainly in COVID situations is electronic communication in a variety of forms whether it be trading, whether it be us hosting virtual webinars, something that we keep saying 10 years ago wouldn't work, but if we tried to do this five years ago, would not have operated as it does today. Trading isn't the only thing we care about, of course. Post-trade becomes much more important as we move, move forward into regulatory challenges and also um, centralizing the infrastructure for our businesses, which have dramatically changed over, over the past periods. We've spent an extensive period of time preparing our clients for regulatory environments such as SFTR. Um, and our infrastructure has grown dramatically because of that. So we continue to, and we will continue to invest in the Potrace infrastructure. And SFTR becomes the building block for things such as CSDR and how we revolutionize and help evolve the post-trade environment and the certainty of settlement that our industry not only needs, but requires to remain very efficient and to grow beyond where we are right now. So connecting is important. Looking at how we um, move across environments is important between um, repo and securities finance. And as part of that, I mean, the ERCC also has collateral in its line. Collateral becomes incredibly important to us as a business and I think the market-wide efficiency whether it be trading, where we look at our launch of our collateral trading product, whether it be exposure without, with certainty of calculations, or whether it be optimization at a pre-trade, pre-delivery, and post-trade environment. These are the things that keep Equilend busy as we expand further and further into our client base and look to further electronify our business to be future-proof. With that, and uh, hopefully a relatively short introduction. Um, I thank you for your time. I thank you um, for, for being present today, and I hand to Godfried. Thank you very much, Grant, for those welcoming words. Now, webinars are popular as it's working from home, but I'm sure we will have again meetings in person from time to time. Working from home was actually one of the topics in a previous webinar hosted by Equident, where we discussed the pros and cons of the current way we work. Last week in the Financial Times, there was an article read the resilience of cities for financial business operators. It ended on the positive note that when the pandemic will eventually disappear, the strength of financial city centers will reassert themselves, where we will enjoy productive lives with occasionally working from home in the countryside. But in the meantime, let's stay safe. The ERCC committee, elected by electronic votes nearly a year ago, under the now chairmanship of Garrett, has continued to work as always. So take this as a reminder of the forthcoming elections in December. As you may recall, about two years ago, I chaired a meeting around intraday liquidity. As you may recall, the ERCC OPS has uh, been tasked to look at this more, and you hear a little bit about that later. As liquidity and fluidity of collateral is crucial for our work, we revisited the topic in our annual ECB ERCC meeting. On that, James will also provide you more details. Repo was mentioned as a crucial function of modern capital markets. And in the webinar that Martin Cech uh, hosted as Chief Executive of ICMA, 
with Aruna Otech, academic scholar of the University of Oxford and former treasurer and vice president of the World Bank. I was, I was very much appreciated the comments she made that work of ICMA in the repo market is very, very good, particularly in developing nations. However, our task is never finished. And I want to in particular draw your attention to Europe's current market infrastructure. A forthcoming publication from the ECB will revisit the work of the central bank in the post-rate area. I can only repeat what I said on many occasions. It was a historical mistake to ignore the implications for the back office when the euro was introduced. All legacy infrastructures remained in place. And it was only after the initial work of the Giovannini Group, where Mrs. Gertrude Kugerel from the ECB introduced what we now know as target to securities. At that point, efforts have been made already to create a unique, harmonized, efficient, and cheap back office for the Eurozone. Work is not finished. Despite all the good work of the Euro system and the ECB at the time of the sovereign debt crisis, with the quantitative easing to prevent the collapse of the single currency, again, the non-harmonized lending programs to make purchase securities available from a central point to the market was another opportunity missed that would have made it easier for collateral management. So, as we are now moving to a COVID-19 recovery budget of 750 billion euro, I would hope that policymakers in Brussels, together with ECB, finally centralize those AAA plus issues so we as repo collateral guardians can show the efficiency of such a move. I would put the euro area on an equal footing as the US Treasury market at that moment. There has been a lot of discussions and talk about the internationalization of the euro currency, while to my mind, it can only progress in that way when these new European bonds are easy to access, easy to process, and can be used by the next generations of repo market participants in a simpler way as the US government bonds. The future of Europe requires many actions, not only completing the job of monetary union, but also getting on with banking union and capital markets union. On that note, let me give you the floor to our first speaker, Richard Komoto, who will give us an update on the ICMA ERC repo survey with a flavor of FFTR that has finally gone live. Richard. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to talk first of all about SFTR, just to remind you that some limited data has been published uh, by the four trade repositories since July. The trade repositories publish the turnover over each week and the outstanding stock of SFTs at the end of each week in terms of value and in terms of number of transactions. They also report um, the market value of the collateral allocated to those transactions. Um, there are breakdowns offered in the data into the type of SFT, so repurchase transactions or buy sellbacks, commodities and securities borrowing and lending and, and margin lending. Um, the data also shows whether the transactions are cleared or not and whether the reporting and other counterparties are in the EA or outside. There's a breakdown into market segment, whether the trade is OTC or is involved in entity that has a MIC code which may or may not be an electronic platform. And then there's various other bits of data, such as the method of collateralization, whether it's title transfer or some form of security interest, reconciliation status at the trade repository, for example, whether um, both parties um, have to report or only one has to report, and finally, whether floating interest rates have been used, um, at, for example, in the repo rate or in securities lending as the rebate rate. Now, um, this data, and we'll refer to it as we go through, it's um, interesting, but there really isn't enough of it to be very informative, and one would hope that over time further data is released or is included in the publication. We also have to be very careful about the data in its current state. It is still building up. And the collateral data is clearly being aggregated in a way that doesn't make any sense, and we're not entirely, um, it's not entirely clear how the loan data is compiled. So um, one has to be cautious. At the moment, uh, we understand that uh, when I'm talking about building up, when reporting started, there were about half a million reports a week, and then in the middle of September, that got up to 3.2 million. So that number is clearly going to go on rising. This is a very different approach using four trade repositories and everybody reporting everything to the approach taken in the US, where data is being taken from the financial market infrastructures, the CCPs and the tri-party agents only, and in Japan, where the data, a limited set of data is being taken from a sample of the 50, 50 largest financial institutions. 
So we'll compare the data as, as we go through, but remember we have to be quite cautious about the SFT numbers at this stage. So this is the result of the latest survey, which was uh, c conducted in June 2020. Um, and there's a fallback in the, in the headline number of the survey to about 7.9 trillion um, from 8.3 trillion in December. So a number of reasons uh, why this might have been the case. Certainly a number of banks have cut back their balance sheets, whereas the others have expanded. And of course, we also get uh, the effect of central bank liquidity perhaps coming in and reducing the need for the market. So the headline numbers reduced by 5.1% since December, but up one6 um, year on year. If we use a constant sample, we get slightly different numbers, as you can see. Now, the closest SFT number at that point, outstanding transactions on the 24th of July, that's the, the first um, real publi uh, publication date that we can, be, we can use. There was one on the 17th of July, but it was clearly defective. It was a starting number. So I've used the 24th of July, that's 7.8 trillion. So we were quite chuffed that um, the numbers were close, but of course, this is coincidence. Um, we have very different um, samples and double counting is treated very differently in the two. Um, but what we can say is that the SFTR number has been, has been building up since then. And in fact, the latest data, which was to Friday, the 2nd of October, is now at 11.9 trillion, and we would expect it to continue to go up. But we feel quite vindicated because um, clearly the numbers are in the same ballpark, so that's rather good. Um, however, a comment, SFTR data has apparently been less than most people have expected, perhaps in particular less than the TRs have expected, so that may create issues about the economics of the whole project. This is the outstanding value of repo from the SFTR. As you see, I've got to 11.7 there, but we have to add on last week's, which takes us to 11.9. Now, this growth is probably not market growth. It's probably more to do with people improving their reporting uh, and, and uh, really people starting reporting late in better validation by trade repositories. Um, so I wouldn't read too much into this, that trend at this stage. SFTR, one very interesting number it does provide, which we didn't have before, is turnover. So the, the number there, 17.3 trillion a, a week, um, equivalent to about 3.5 trillion a day, um, that's actually in the latest survey, um, it's now um, 3.7 trillion per day. But again, remember, this number is building up. Um, it's about 115,000 transactions a day in repo, which is also a, an, an interesting number. And, and quite close to an ICMA estimate done a couple of years ago. So we do a breakdown into really venues in, in, in a way. So direct trading, ATS, automatic trading systems, voice brokers, and tri-party. Now I emphasize ATS, automatic trading systems, this is automatic. This is central limit order book type systems. So it's really just um, broker tech, MTS, Eurex, um, six. It's not the automated platforms like TradeWeb and GMLX. They would be in our direct numbers. And you can see the direct numbers have been quite healthy and growing in recent surveys, whereas the automate, automatic trading systems, you know, there's a suggestion that the market may be saturated in, in that sector. Voice brokers have been on a secular decline over the whole survey period of almost 20 years, uh, with a brief respite during the crisis where they were able to provide um, useful liquidity but that doesn't appear to have been the case in the COVID crisis. And then Triparty has really bumped along below about 11, 12%, um, and then fell, we assume, as a result of central bank liquidity um, since 2016, but has been recovering and continues. And the question is, why has Triparty continued to recover despite um, fresh central bank liquidity being pumped into the market? Well, it may be partly related to the dash for cash during the COVID crisis and the fact that that isn't perhaps being transmitted uh, or central bank liquidity isn't being transmitted as efficiently as it once would have been given that banks are restricting their intermediation. Uh, just a comment on the SFTR data, we can't make comparisons. So if you look at the EEA entities that have MIC codes, there's almost 49% according to SFTR. But remember, a lot of people have MIC codes who aren't trading platforms. Um, this would include, uh, and we think there's some misreporting here as well. So uh, you can't really compare that to our ATS number. Um, remember, it'll, it'll be part of our direct business as well, where the automated trading systems are involved. 
But one interesting number which we can perhaps take of SFTR is that all OTC trades account for over half the market um, in terms of new transactions. And this is our geographical analysis. You can see cross-border trade has been dominant for uh, and stable for a long time, um, whereas there's a strange relationship between domestic business and anonymous trading. So this is CCP cleared electronic trading largely, and we can't really explain that inverse relationship uh, too well. If we look at the SFTR numbers, then we can see that CCP cleared repo in terms of outstanding um, was a, just under 44%. Now, if you compare that to the anonymous figure, um, which is CCP cleared in our numbers, which is 19.5%, well, we would actually increase that 19.5% to 27.2 if we take into account post-trade clearing. So we're really comparing 40, about 44% from SFTR with just over 27% in our numbers. And in fact, we can explain that quite easily. The SFTR numbers include reporting by the CCPs themselves of CCP cleared repos, whereas our numbers do not include any CCP reporting. So we are probably, again, um, you know, fairly close to each other in that respect. This is a breakdown of the cross-border activity, and you'll see at the top, the red line, is where business is going into the Eurozone. But the problem, given the limitations on our methodology, we don't know where the business is coming from. It can, could be coming from within the Eurozone and staying within the Eurozone, but just simply crossing national borders, or it could be coming from outside the Eurozone, from, say, London, and going into a Eurozone market. Um, and that has been robust, growing, um, and is, is the dominant part of cross-border business. If we go to the blue line below, um, we see that this is activity where uh, the trade is going outside the Eurozone, but remember the origin can be inside or outside the Eurozone. So um, we, we have a limited hold on what this tells us, but that has not really been a robust part of the business. Uh, in terms of currency, we see that uh, the euro is the dominant share, but as we'll see when we look at the, um, uh, the, the time series, that share has been declining over time. And you can see that sterling and the dollar, and to a lesser extent the yen, have, uh, have take quite a significant proportion of business um, within Europe. So this is the trend. You can see a, a secular downtrend in the euro, some of that due to central bank liquidity, but others, a large part of it due to the increase in interest in, in dollars, which um, there's been quite a lot of activity recently, but that's not new. Since the crisis, the dollar has accounted for a much more significant portion um, of the European market. Uh, sterling more recently has taken an increasing share, um, and that may reflect uh, in, in a number of uh, uses of repo in relation to that currency. This is collateral analysis, and we see core Eurozone uh, collateral here, and the share of, the, of um, German collateral has been falling over the whole survey, and this reflects the status of that collateral and the, and the shortage, and uh, since the crisis, certainly the hoarding of that and the reluctance of people to lend high high quality liquid assets like this. Now, French collateral has also started to decline from the peak it reached in 2018. And this is what we know all core Eurozone collateral is being treated in a fairly similar way. Um, and so people are becoming more reluctant to lend that. The exception, perhaps I've, the, 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 the orange line there is in fact Belgian collateral, um, and trade the labels disappeared that doesn't show the same sort of correlation with the other core Eurozone securities. So this is peripheral Eurozone securities, and the most dramatic line there is the decline in Italian collateral, which when we started the survey was really, that was European GC, and then it declined rapidly even before the 2008 crisis, but that took it to a new low. But afterwards, with central bank action, um, that's recovered, but what we see here is that it's really off it. That recovery may well be over. We will have to follow that trend, um, despite the support received from the ECB um, during the COVID crisis. The profile of the Spanish collateral is really driven by the liquidity needs of Spanish banks, and so it's a little bit idiosyncratic. This is just a series we've had um, since 2015, showing the use of US Treasury specifically and JGBs. So uh, a lot of activity in the last couple of years in U.S. Treasuries. JGBs have reflected things like uh, foreign exchange arbitrage opportunities, 
also relative price of, of um, HQLA and so on, but uh, that is slightly subsiding. And then this is our slide of EU government securities as a percentage of all EU securities being used as collateral. Um, we see the, the diversification of collateral until the crisis, and then a return, a limited return to government bonds. After the crisis, some government bonds became less desirable, such as Italian government bonds. Others became even more desirable, and to some extent those cancelled out. More recently, we've seen a step up in the use of government bonds, and now we're back to 90% where we almost where we started from in 2001. So the demand for good collateral, particularly in stress market conditions, is predominating. So this is our maturity analysis. Now each set of columns, there should be seven columns within each group. They are the last, the current, and the previous six surveys. So the first set of columns to the left are open transactions, and then we go one day, two days to one week, one week to one month, um, one month to three months, three months to six months, and so on, and then forwards on the right-hand side. There is a simpler way of looking at these, but if you just look at the red column on the right of each set, you'll notice that there's a jump in the one day to one week segment, and in particular, the three month to six month segment, which we take as an indicator of collateral transformation activity. And then finally, over on the right-hand side, a fall back in forward repo from the serious peaks that it reached um, a couple of years ago, almost 20% of the market. And if we break all that activity down into repo and reverse repo, what we discover in the June survey is that the sample um, of almost or about 60 institutions in our survey have been basically borrowing short term, so that's the red column repo, and lending longer term. So you can see the open overnight and up to 30 days uh, it's net borrowing by our sample, and then beyond that, it's net lending. And we can take another view of this if we go to the next slide. And if you look at this one and look at the table, again, focus on the red column, you'll see on the one day and two days to one week segment, a uh, sharp increase in borrowing and then lending in the longer term. And that really has reversed the trend we saw over the previous year. Um, so banks borrowing short, lending long. But this is our weighted average. So assuming everything is at the maximum end of each maturity band, uh, you get the red line. Assuming everything is at the minimum end of each maturity bucket, you get the, um, the lower blue line. And you can see that there was a recovery in average maturities, which has been reversed over the first six months of this year. We assume that is the COVID crisis impact. And then finally, um, floating uh, or type of interest rate. So we measure floating rate repo at 9.3%. We don't get any numbers out of SFTR because they have a threshold above which they, below which they don't report any of the floating rates. So none of the floating rates have accounted for more than 5 billion euros per week um, and or have had more than six counterparties trading. So there's an interesting reflection on floating rate repo in the in the market, we would have at least thought something like Ionia and ESTA um, would have showed up, but it hasn't yet. So um, I'll finish there. Thank you. So over the next um, 10 to 15 minutes or so, we're going to discuss the work that the ERCC has been undertaking on the day liquidity. Um, we'll focus on what's been achieved to date, and, and importantly, we're going to focus on what are, the, what are the key open questions that we must get answers to so that we can move forward. So I think the first point to make is that this is not a new topic. The industry has been aware of the challenges for some time. And three years ago, the challenges were highlighted by the European Post-Trade Forum. This was an expert group that was set up by the European Commission to focus on, on post-trade topics. Now, there are different ways to uh, address intraday liquidity challenges, um, but one of those ways is to optimize and improve settlement rates across the market. And therefore, that's been a key focus of the ERCC's work in recent months and forms a lot of the basis of the initial recommendations that have been set out and that we'll cover um, in a few moments. Thankfully, the ERCC and ICMA, we're not a load range in this work, nor is the work contained just the European fixed income and repo. Earlier in the year, um, AFME published its recommendations to improve settlement rates, and these included encouraging a greater use of partial settlement. Um, similarly, the LMMA, the London Money Market Association, has begun to study the settlement and intraday liquidity challenges associated with guilt repo, and we expect to see some firm recommendations come out there soon. I think the important point to make here is that ICMA and the RCC 
are working closely and speaking to the LMMA and AFME. So this is really a collaborative industry effort. How, you know, we're talking about what, what ICMA and the RC has done, but how have we really responded um, to this challenge? And as Godfrey referred to in his introduction, there was a cross-industry workshop about kind of at the end of 2018 that was attended by a broad group of stakeholders, including um, the ECB. The analysis was detailed. We mapped out many use cases and we showed the movements of cash and securities between both the T2S environment and the ICSD environment. And we showed that across both inter-dealer repo transactions and we showed it across dealer to client transactions and also where banks play different roles. So a bank might be a dealer, but it might also be a prime broker in the same transaction. And each of those different environments can give rise to different intraday liquidity and settlement challenges. So it was important to take the time to really map out all of those use cases and detail. Now, this has led to a number of recommendations, but equally and importantly, it's actually led to more open questions, which is where we want to take the next stage of the analysis. So the way we've grouped our findings today has really been in, in three ways. We want to reinforce some existing best practice. We want to introduce some new best practice. And lastly, we want to optimize settlement behavior. But that's where at the moment the most questions remain. Now, the RCC has for some time has, for some time had a best practice guide um, for both the trading and post-trade and the settlement practices of repo transactions. And in fact, the last edition was published um, a couple of weeks ago. Now, this guide contains details on best practices, and one of those is shaping. So shaping encourages a standard shape size, which in Europe is around 50 million nominal, which many institutions, including my own LCH, um, adhere to today. But we can improve further still. Um, in the US, shaping is performed by the settlement system, by the Fedwire settlement system at 50 million nominal shapes. It's not optional, it just happens. So should we as a European community look to challenge ourselves further? Should the T2S CSDs and the ICSDs automatically shape as opposed to leaving that as uh, the responsibility um, of the member firms and the dealer firms? Similarly for partialing, the current best practice in the guide is for firms to accept partial deliveries. Again, this is adopted by many firms, but, but not by all, uh, because their barriers exist. For example, auto partialing is a standard feature of T2S, um, but not all firms adopt it. Why? Similarly, custodians may be unable to partial because they're challenged from either A, a resource perspective, or B, a technology standpoint. So the key point here is really there are barriers today to everyone adopting standard functionality, and we need to work together as a community to collectively remove those barriers. Likewise, um, there are also some new recommendations that we'd like to, to focus on. One of them we'll pick out here is, is T2S hold and release. T2S hold and release is a piece of functionality within T2S, which is standardized, and it allows parties to make an early submission of settlement instructions into the CSD for matching, but then to be able to hold them back until settlement is possible, at which point the instructions can be released. So on paper, that's a really, really good thing because it encourages early matching, which has been a focus of the RCC in recent years. However, it's possible for firms to potentially um, misuse hold and release by using it as a tool to manage their own intraday liquidity needs by matching early, but then withholding settlement until it suits them personally from an intraday liquidity perspective. Now, that is entirely rational from an individual firm's perspective, but collectively, it could be to detriment of the wider market. So therefore, one of the things we want to do as a group is to enhance and introduce some additional best practice around T2S hold and release in the best practice guide. I think the most interesting aspect of the analysis um, is, really, is really this slide. Now, the data that you see here in the charts is T2S settlement data for last year, for 2019. Um, but the data so far this year looks incredibly similar. Now, the top graph um, shows the average value of instructions that settle in the nighttime settlement cycle of T2S. So T2S has two settlement cycles. One is the nighttime cycle. The other one is the daytime, or otherwise known as, as real-time cycle. Now, the nighttime cycle is shown in, in the blue, and the real-time cycle is shown in the, the orange or, or kind of yellow color. Now, it's the top graph that was surprising to us. Now, the top graph shows the value of instructions that are settling in the nighttime cycle versus the real-time cycle. It was surprising that only 30 to 35% of T2S settlements by value occur in the nighttime cycle. Why was it surprising? It's surprising because a lot of firms deliberately instruct to settle in the nighttime cycle. Why do they do that? Well, they do that because there's a lot of advantages to settling in the nighttime cycle. On the one hand, it's cheaper. 
Um, sediment in a nighttime cycle of T to S is 23 and a half cents versus just over 28 cents to settle in, in the daytime cycle. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you scale that up to thousands of transactions, that is a meaningful impact to a bottom line of a firm. Secondly, the nighttime cycle can potentially provide for better netting. And then lastly, it potentially uses what is seen as cheaper overnight, liqu overnight liquidity as opposed to more expensive intraday liquidity. So there's lots of advantages. Um, a lot of firms you know, are instructing deliberately to settle in the nighttime cycle, but unfortunately, not much by value is settling in the nighttime cycle. So our conclusion as a group has been that we're most likely misunderstanding or not understanding what can and cannot settle in the nighttime cycle and all the reasons why that is the case. And so to help us understand this more, we quite simply need more data. We need to understand what is and is not settling the nighttime cycle and the reasons why. We need the data broken down by asset class and we need a repo specific view. We also need the NCBs to provide us this data at the level of the individual T to S CSD and market. And we need comparable data for the ICSDs because a lot of client activity, buy side activity, still settles in Euroclear Bank or Clearstream Bank in Luxembourg, the ICSDs. And lastly, we'd like a breakdown between this, this, between this data, between what is cleared, CCP cleared, and uncleared flow. So this really is the crux of where we see the key challenge that we'd like to spend the next part of our analysis focusing on. Now, as Godfrey mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we had the ERCC annual meeting with the ECB, and we spent 45 minutes discussing this topic and spent a lot of time on this particular slide. And this is the ask that we've given, as I've just described, so describing really um, what we want in terms of data. I think the good news is that the ECB understand the ask, they're obviously keen to increase the amount of settlements that go into T2S. They're keen to understand and how they can improve the functionality. And they were very receptive to providing or, or helping to provide this additional data. So we can obviously keep the group updated as this progresses. So I guess with that said, you know, we need to wait for the data, but we're not standing still. And there's a couple of things that we'd like to do um, in the next few weeks and months. So firstly, ICMA and the RCC are going to work on a communication to re-emphasize the existing best practices that are there today in the best practice guide. Secondly, we're going to update that best practice guide with enhanced guidance around things like T2S hold and release. And lastly, uh, but by no means least, we want to broaden the working group participation. We have a, a large number of participants at the moment, but we welcome more. This is really a collective effort. And in particular, we welcome participation from the buy side and their custodians. They're a really important element to this analysis. So if you'd like to get involved, please speak to Godfrey, Gareth, or myself, and we can certainly include you in the next working group. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening, and I'd like to hand over to Lisa, who's going to provide us with the legal updates from the RCC Enigma. Lisa, over to you. Thank you very much, James. My name is Lisa Cleary, and I'm a Senior Director in ICMA's legal department. Today, I want to give you a brief overview of some of the headline issues which ICMA has been working on from a repo collateral perspective since we last spoke to you at our virtual uh, podcast AGM in March. So first up, the legal opinion exercise, which, as you all know, I'm sure, has for many years been organised on a coordinated basis with ISLA. The ICMA GMRA portion of the legal opinions covers both the enforceability of the netting provisions of the GMRA as well as the validity of the agreement as a whole. The 2020 updates to the opinions were published in April 2020, so that was a deadline we were really pleased to meet with everyone newly working from home at that point. Um, so the delivery of, of that body of work was, um, was a great success. ICMA obtained updates to the legal opinions on the GMRA in 64 jurisdictions and also added a new GMRA legal opinion for Argentina. I would also note that since that April publication, we've published interim update memos in relation to the opinions for England, Russia, Slovakia, and Argentina as well. You will by now, I'm sure, I've said it many times in this forum and other ERCC forums, you'll be aware that with the support of the ERCC committee, we have discontinued coverage of the GMRA 1995 in the legal opinions, and that's been from 2019. So the opinions will no longer cover the 1995 arrangement, annexes to the 1995 arrangement, or amendments to the core provisions of that agreement. 
So we're keen to do anything we can to encourage members to move to the latest version of the GMRA documentation. If there's anything we can do to assist you with this, including guidance in relation to the use of the GMRA 2011 protocol, which is an extremely efficient tool for multilateral contract amendment, please do get in touch with me. We'd be really pleased to help you. The opinions are, as ever, based on a comprehensive pro forma with standardised counterparty coverage. We do really encourage members to provide us with feedback on the form and the scope of the opinions so that we can consider any comments as we prepare for the next update. We are, in fact, already preparing for the 2021 exercise, so now really is the time to reach out to us in, in respect of jurisdictional counterparty coverage. The next headline topic is CSER and the introduction specifically of a regulatory buy-in mechanism as a supposed settlement discipline tool. And my colleague Andy Hill will speak to the regulatory developments in his presentation, but I just wanted to highlight the work that has been done in relation to this from a documentation perspective. Firstly, on the ICMA rules and recommendations for the secondary market, so the OTC cash rules, but also in relation to the GMRA in the form of a CSDR settlement discipline annex. As we reported to you back in March, the industry had requested that we consider compliance as well as market impact in our documentation solutions. So that is that we gold plate the requirements of the regulations such that issues like price differential asymmetry on buy and execution or cash, cash compensation are resolved contractually. The industry had also requested at that time that we consider various means by which contractual amendments can be made, so either bilaterally or, or via mutualized form in a protocol or otherwise. But since then, the situation has really changed in various stages. So the scope of that work has changed in response to insufficient regulatory guidance on key issues, and more recently with the announcement of the CSDR review. So as a consequence, we have refocused efforts on engaging with our technical working groups and preparing for future consultation on this file. There are really large and active working groups developing these work streams, and we encourage broad market participation. It's been a really good example of seeing um, the legal representatives from both the ERCC legal working group and a much broader um, remit of, of, of firms and, and legal reps being involved with more um, market-led working groups under Andy's um, oversight. So a, a really a really good example of that and, and why that collaboration is so important. So please do get in touch if, if this file is of interest to you. I wanted to bookmark other headline topics which the ERCC Legal Working Group are considering. We don't have too much time to go into detail today, um, but just so I've highlighted those to you in case they're of interest. I've already covered the CSDR. Secondly, I previously spoke at this forum about an ERCC-sponsored project to develop initial margin pledge documentation. The plan had been to focus initially on the development of pledge documentation only for initial margin and to decide subsequently if there was a need for a security interest agreement. But based on market developments, members have now expressed a preference to reverse that approach. So we're going to prioritize the security interest agreement, particularly given as this would seem to provide more immediate benefits to the industry in terms of jurisdictions where netting is not enforceable. This work is at its first stages, but it is now underway. So again, if you are interested in participating in the working group, please do let me know. Next on that list, just to highlight that we recently submitted a response to the EBA consultation on BRRD2, in particular focusing on concerns about document remediation impacts and those being quite significant, the proposals do stay as they are. So it's available on our website for you to reference and it is a file that we'll continue to monitor, so expect to see more action on, on that. Next, um, just to note that Brexit obviously remains a key consideration and that we intend to refresh the FAQ on Brexit in relation to the GMRA that is available on the ICMA website. Again, it's a, another piece of work that um, if you have uh, comments or questions or feedback before that refresh happens, now is the time to speak to me. And then next on that list, we, we continue generally to monitor RepoTech innovations. Um, we're discussing pro proposals at the moment for projects relating to standardization of particular clauses in in-house GMRA templates, which can vary from firm to firm, um, but perhaps 
want to achieve the same business outcome. So we're in the process of establishing the use case and assessing market interest. Again, really keen to have your thoughts. And this, of course, is part of the broader cross-cutting theme at ICMA of fintech and digital innovation, to which I know my colleague Gabriel will, will speak to in, in more detail a little later on. Lastly, I would just like to thank you for your time today and really encourage you to stay in touch with ICMA via email or phone. I've given the details there of our legal help desk. This is particularly important whilst we find ourselves um, working remotely. We do really want to stay in touch. I will now hand over to my colleague, Alex, for an update on SFTR implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. So as you know, uh, SFTR has been a, a huge focus uh, over the past years for the industry as a whole, but, but also for us at, at ICMA as we've uh, tried to hopefully successfully lead the implementation effort for SFTR reporting of repos. And that uh, included providing a forum for the industry to coordinate that process, but also supporting it with uh, very detailed best practice recommendations. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that um, in a minute. Just to show you really some, some key milestones on the, on the very long, six and a half years long road uh, from the initial commission proposal um, on SFTR in 2014 to the 13th of July this year, which was uh, really a big day for everyone involved. The SFTR reporting finally went live, at least for the, for the first two phases, which covered banks and investment firms, but also um, CCPs and, and CSDs. And of course, that was uh, three months later than, than initially planned, thanks to the, to the helpful delay ESMA granted uh, back, back in March. So a few words just on the, on the go life itself. As you probably all know, the feedback has been really positive, especially compared to, to similarly complex precedents, mainly, of course, uh, MIFIA uh, and EMEA reporting. So in comparison to those, SFTR has been, has been really smooth. From the start, trade repositories have reported very high acceptance rates uh, for submitted reports, which uh, basically means that, uh, that firms have correctly implemented reporting logic. And that's definitely a big achievement uh, already considering the scale and the, and the complexity of the reporting requirements. And ESMA themselves have, in fact, acknowledged that as well. Of course, that doesn't say much yet about data quality and reconciliation. So between the between the two sides of the of the report, which still remains uh, a little more challenging. But overall, the the experience so far has certainly been very positive. Um, also considering, of course, the, the very difficult uh, circumstances. And and I think the the level of cross industry collaboration on on this project over the years has has definitely been a a key factor and, and really quite 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 unique. But this is not the end of the road. So just in terms of next steps, um, what's still to come? Um, of course, uh, we still have two go live phases uh, ahead. Most imminently next week, um, the buy side will start reporting. Uh, this has been a, a big focus for us uh, over the past weeks. And then the final phase in January 2021, um, when non-financial counterparties uh, will start reporting. Important to note that there's an exception in the UK where NFCs won't need to report at all, which was uh, clarified by the UK government a few weeks ago. And that leads me straight on to the next point, uh, Brexit itself, or rather the, the end of the transition period. That's, of course, also a big topic uh, in itself. Um, still quite a, quite a few questions open, but what we definitely know is that uh, this will split SFTI in two at the end of the, at the, end of the year. Um, we're, of course, following uh, both sides very closely and have a good dialogue with, uh, with both uh, ESMA and, and the FCA. Also to note, um, ESMA Level 3 guidance, um, to some degree, this is also still work in progress. The final guidelines were, of course, published back in, back in January, along with a number of other important documents, including the, the validation rules, um, but also the, the XML uh, reporting schemas. But there are still, still a number of quite significant issues um, with both of those documents. Um, so we're waiting for updated versions um, of those as well. And in addition, um, we also expect ESMA to, to publish some, some Q&As, 
some formal Q&As with additional clarifications, although the timing still remains to be, to be seen, um, but certainly there's no, no lack of open questions. Okay, then coming on to, to our um, SFTR work at ICMA, most of you will be will be aware uh, of our dedicated SFTR task force, which we established already back in uh, 2016. Um, so this group continues to be extremely active uh, even after the go live, the initial go live. Um, we're meeting uh, on a uh, at least biweekly basis um, with always well over 100 uh, participants uh, joining. So really great engagement, um, and also important, we have a have an extremely broad representation on the group, um, which has been really positive and, and certainly quite quite key to the work, especially um, given that the, there's a strong focus on, on market-wide best practices, um, which have always been considered a, a key element for the for the successful implementation of SFTR, and I think. Uh, Fair to say that we delivered on that expectation. Um, so I've listed here um, a few of the key documents that we produced. Uh, most importantly, of course, our ICMA recommendations for reporting under SFTR. Um, over the over the past years, this has become a, a really comprehensive document. We released the fourth public version in September. Um, now nearly 300 pages long. Um, and covering uh, really all the aspects of, of SFTR. So that document continues to evolve um, and for the time being also to grow. But Richard, who's, who's holding the pen on, on this and, and other best practices, has also started to consolidate and, and shorten some of the background sections. So hopefully um, the guide will become a little more, a little easier to digest in, in the future. So along with the with the recommendations, we also published uh, two other best practice documents, our SFTR sample reports, um, and an overview of repo lifecycle events. But we also produced uh, some uh, number of internal documents uh, which are available to um, ICMA members only uh, through our uh, SFTR task force member page. And there's a link on the on the last slide. You can click if you have your login details as ICMA member. And of course, there's also the, the public data, um, which we're consolidating on a, on a weekly basis, as Richard mentioned earlier. More recently, a key focus, of course, uh, has been on the, on the actual reporting uh, experience and the feedback we've, received, we've been receiving from, from members on, 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 on issues, reporting issues that firms are, are still grappling with. So just here, this slide to give you a flavor of the issues we're, we're looking at in this context, we've put together a list uh, of around 50 problems now, which we also shared with, with regulators already. And, and of course, which also serves as an important uh, feedback loop uh, back to our recommendation. So that has led as well to, to a number of updates um, in the guide itself. The list includes problems throughout the, the reporting process. So that means problems that lead to reactions, rejections uh, of reports at the, at the trade repository, but also issues that prevent pairing of the two sides um, of the report. And finally, and that's the majority of issues, problems that lead to breaks in the, in the matching process of individual fields. Another important distinction to mention, most of the problems are down to inconsistent uh, static data, for instance, or firms not following the rules correctly or indeed our, our recommendations. But there's also quite a significant number of issues um, which are due to, to problems and flaws in the underlying rules and, and the ESMA guidance. So for instance, I already mentioned the issues with validation rules and, and schema issues. So those are all um, require some, some action from, from regulators, from ESMA and, and the NCAs uh, in order to be resolved. And finally, there's also, there are some important issues that haven't even materialized yet, but which are bound to create uh, quite big problems. And, and here I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, issuer LEIs. So ESMA allowed uh, for a grace period for non-EU issuers, um, given the huge gaps in availability of the LEI, but that will come to a close in, in April next year. So as of then, uh, we will see that cause problems. 
Another example um, is the reporting of settlement fails for repo. Another big issue and, 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 and something that we've discussed repeatedly with ESMA um, and where we've received some unfortunate guidance from them and, and that discussion is still still ongoing. So that's uh, that's it for the for the quick run through uh, on SFTR. There's a lot more detailed information uh, available on our website, and there are some some links here. So please do have a look. Um, there's also a webinar that we recently had on SFTR, which I would recommend. But it's quite a good discussion we had with with some of the key members. And with that, I hand over to to Andy for an update on the second big. Uh, regulatory headache that we're facing uh, CSDR mandatory bias. Andy, over to you. As Alex said, uh, CSDR settlement discipline is a, a major priority for us and a major headache for us and has been for, for some time, in particular the mandatory buy-in component, which has serious implications for, for not only the cash market, but also the repo market, both directly and indirectly, and not just in terms of the implementation challenges, but also the unintended consequences related to changes in, in market participant behavior and, and the knock-on effects for, for market liquidity and general functioning of, of the repo and lending markets. Anyway, I'll provide just some brief updates on the regulatory developments and also our, our work related to that. First point is in June, uh, June 23rd, the UK announced that it, amongst uh, a number of other regulatory initiatives post, uh, post Brexit, it would not be looking to implement the CSDR settlement discipline measures. Instead, it suggested that the market continue to rely on market-based remedies for the settlement fails, which is very encouraging, but it also needs to be remembered that this only applies to settlements within the UK the extraterritorial impacts of, of CSDL settlement discipline, essentially anything that settles on an EU CSD, including the ICSDs, uh, it, the extraterritorial reach of that remains vast, and it doesn't matter if you're if you're in in, in London or or for that matter New York, Singapore, or Kathmandu, you, you'll still be in scope if it's um, if you're settling on Euroclear or Clearstream. On July 20th, we submitted. Uh, our response to the ESMA survey on topics for the CSDR review. This is quite important because this was gearing up to the CSDR review, which we hope will be later this year, which I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. This was an opportunity for the industry to flag to ESMA the, the, the topics that they thought were very important. Obviously, we spent a lot of time on the mandatory buy-in piece, as did other associations. In fact, the feedback from ESMA was that 90% of, of all the responses seemed to, to focus on, on Article 7 settlement discipline. On August 24th, the long-awaited um, announcement or, or publication in the official journal of the, the postponement, postponement settlement discipline until February 2021 was completed. Um, at this point, focus was really on what we were awaiting, which is a, the amount, amending draft RTS from ESMA, which would delay settlement discipline implementation of another year to February 2022. Now, it's important to remember that ESMA did this in response to a request from the Commission, which was largely influenced by, by delays due to an, an, an implementation. Uh, practicalities and considerations related to COVID. This is not yet in law. This this has to be approved by the Commission, which we assume it will be, given that it was their suggestion, and followed by a, a three-month um, objection period for the, uh, the Council and the European Parliament. But we are confident that this delay will happen. I won't say too much about implementation. Lisa, Lisa touched on, on some of the major points earlier. We are looking to support contractual implementation of the, the buy-in regime, both in, in the cash market through updating the RTMA buy-in rules and in, in the, the repo market through the, um, the CSDR annex to the, the GMRA. As Lisa mentioned, this work is currently on hold, and the reason why it's on hold is because we are now awaiting the CSDR review. Now, the CSDR review was meant to happen last year, it got delayed because of other priorities and pushed back further, probably because of COVID. We were always under the impression that settlement discipline would never be part of the review on the basis that it hadn't been implemented. There now seems to be a change of attitude in the, in the Commission, and, and I think this is partly driven 
by the increase in settlement sales during the, the peak of the crisis back in, back in March and April. And if you overlay a mandatory buy-in regime on this, what would that have looked like? What would that have done to liquidity? What would that have done to pricing and, and, and market efficiency? So I think there is a growing concern about the, the mandatory buy-in regime and, and the calibration of this. So we've been informed by the Commission informally that it will be included in the review. We hope the review will be in the coming weeks and will include a public consultation. So we're, we're very much gearing up and, and sharpening our pencils ready to respond to this review. As Lisa mentioned, we're doing this in combination with a, a markets-led group, which also includes, uh, there's clearly an important operational element, which so it also includes operational experts, um, but also the, the, the legal community. And we are confident, um, quietly confident, that this is an opportunity to, to drive some meaningful change to the mandatory buy-in provisions. Whether we get rid of them completely, whether we get rid of the mandatory element, we're not sure, but we think we can make some, some, some good changes, um, if, not, um, if not getting quite to where we want to be. So uh, please do feel encouraged to engage in, in that work. We, we run a, a, a very active and very broad uh, working group, and, um, and and it would be good that every firm had at least one representative, ideally from trading, ops, and, and legal in that group. So I will stop there and hand over to my colleague, Gabriel Calson, who will update on the work roundtable relating to the common domain model. Thank you, Andy, and good afternoon. My name is Gabriel Calson, for those who don't know me, and I lead ICMS initiative to extend the ISA derivatives common domain model to recourse and bonds. And I'm pleased to provide an update today on the CDM, the workshops we had in July and August, and the next steps. So to start with, we need to look at where we currently are and where we want to get in the future. Currently, there are inconsistencies in the way repo trades are processed. Transaction data is duplicated across firms' internal systems and between market participants, whether at booking, risk management, or settlement level. And this requires reconciliation resources, and generate costs. The CDM as a trade processing model for repos can be described as a common denominator or common language, if you will, to represent any individual transaction or lifecycle event in an entirely consistent and replicable way. So in practical terms, with a CDM, each party to a transaction would have the same representation of a process or event during the life cycle of a repo. This is each party will implement the same code, as shown here to the left and to the right on the slide. And this is, a, this is from our perspective, a strategic game changer. We expect a number of benefits from it. For a problem from a front office perspective, STP, improved workflows across different execution methods and post trade processes. From an operations perspective, less duplication of data, less reconciliation, interoperability with market infrastructures and other technology solutions, and also greater traceability downstream. From a legal perspective, the model we are proposing to create relies on definitions from the GIMRA, aligning the legal definitions with operations. But also from an IT perspective, we expect there to be less friction by using a universal standard or interface between protocols such as FIX, SPML, or other proprietary standards or formats with the added benefit across asset classes, not only repo, but also derivatives. But an important uh, precondition is, however, adoption by the different stakeholders. So to get to this state, our working group of sales sites, buy sites, training venues, and technology providers met in July and August to define the scope and the draft specification for repo model in the CDM. And this entailed breaking down a transaction into its components, into its components for modeling purposes in the CDM looking at cash and securities as the fundamental components, then the repo-specific component, differentiating the structure for repo and collateral, and the interest calculations embedded as executable code, and also then looking and mapping out the various scenarios from term repo to open repo, et cetera. So as part of this exercise, we have looked more closely at the components in the derivative CDM that can be reused for repos, for example, settlement, transfer of cash and securities, and we have also come across potential issues linked to the financial product markup language, or FPML, which is 
protocol, a messaging protocol commonly used for derivatives, but not for repos. So further work will be required to iron this out and build out a repo model in the CDM. So in terms of next steps, we're currently in the process of finalizing a legal agreement with Regnosis, the fintech firm behind the CDM, but also arrangements with ISDA in regards to IP and governance to ensure that we retain IP rights and maintain control of the model, of the code. So looking ahead, the modeling process is due to start in the second half of October and will require weekly meetings over the course of eight to 12 weeks. First, we will focus on developing a repo product model, a transaction model, initially for the most common scenarios, such as term repo. The processes and life cycle events will then be translated into code and will need to be tested and validated by member firms in collaboration with development teams, IT in particular. And the deliverable is a CDM repo software, so covering common repo transaction scenarios, which will be made available to members. Now, there's two important conditions for the successful and timely delivery of this project. The first is sample data. The model is only as good as the data that is provided by members. And what is required here is data from test transactions anonymized in different formats, whether in fixed, proprietary messages, or other formats, to understand the differences in, in, in the representations across the, the different systems. And as always, any shared data will be treated in the strictest confidence. And the second point is the involvement of colleagues with data modeling and IT background for the implementation and testing of the CDM. So this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention. If you would like to get involved and contribute to this cross-industry initiative, then do please, please get in touch. Also, if you have any questions or would like to discuss further. And um, with this, I will hand over to Gottfried. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. And we're looking forward to seeing uh, the results of this work uh, that I've been following for many, many years now. And uh, it's great to see things uh, moving forward. On the ERCC website page, you can find all the interesting material and background of the topics covered today. But you can also find also the minutes of all the ERCC committee meetings as well as the AGMs. Um, many thanks, of course, today to all those who have contributed to today's event, but also the people supporting the committee, uh, Enigma, and uh, in the other side, in the other industry uh, bodies, and especially, of course, thank to Equidant for the great technical support today and being our host. Now, I hope the next meeting will be in person. We have uh, LCH uh, in Paris who will host us, and I hope by then the pubs will be open, but uh, unfortunately tonight the pubs are closing in Brussels for another month, so the signs are not very good at this stage. But one message remains me to say to all of you, stay safe and hope to see you in March. Thank you very much.